What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the roll up. Today, we have a presentation from Amrit Kumar Restakes Roll Ups. Welcome to Eigenlayer Unlocked, an interactive educational journey through the Eigenlayer ecosystem created by technical founders and builders for the entire crypto community. A special thank you to our partners, All Layer, Polymer, Authentic, Skate, and Lagrange for helping to make this happen. Our goal is to raise the collective knowledge of the Eigenlayer AVS ecosystem and unpack the technical designs of the top teams in space. Welcome to Eigenlayer Unlocked. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the roll-up. Today, we have a presentation from Amrit Kumar about restakes roll-ups. I'm particularly interested in this one. I had a look at the slides. There's a lot of technical diagrams. I know I'm going to have a lot of questions, so excited to dive in. Welcome on. Amrit, it's good to have you back. Well, thank you, Andy. Good to see you again. Sweet. Well, let's jump in and learn about restake rollups, Ben. Yeah, sure. So, um, to give a quick context on why we started working on restake rollups, right? So, uh, for those who are probably new to restake rollups, you might know all clear from its RAS services, right? So, we have helped a lot of companies who wanted to have their own rollup. We have, you know, across, for example, OP Stack, Arbitrum, Orbit. And by the way, unfortunately, I never got the all clear merge, so I'm using Arbitrum merge here. No. <laughs> so, so anyway, so uh, yeah, the idea is basically that we were helping people who wanted to have their own rollups, and uh, we were the one kind of running the, those nodes so that developers would focus on building their own code dApp and would not have to worry about any of the infra stuff, right? We would handle any of that. So um, one common feedback we're getting from all these clients say, hey, it's good that you manage the services for us, but there's no way for us to get our community involved, right? You are the one running the vendor. So you are the vendor, you're running the, my rollups. I will probably build my dApps, but that's it. There's no way for us to get the broader community involved in running and managing rollups. And how could we do that? So this is this was, I, I would say, the initial motivation behind something that makes the system more decentralized, something that makes the broader community get involved in a rollup, right? And as the title suggests, restake rollup is something that brings restaking to rollups. As simple as that. So basically, bring eigenlayers restaking mechanism to rollups and offer certain services. So um, why are we talking about any of this, right? So first of all, I mean, this is something probably you know we have gone through a number of times already, but I think it's still good to give a little bit of context on why we are talking about this, right? Because you know, um, when Arbitrum and, Orbitrum, Arbitrum and Optimism were running about, I think, 2021, they were doing about 50K, 60K transactions a day. So it was very early days of Ethereum, oh, sorry, of Optimism and Arbitrum or L2s when we started as a RAS service. But since then, things have changed dramatically since the launch of OP Stack. And OP Stack got launched, Arbitrum Orbit got live, and then Polygon CDK, now ZK Sync has its own stack, and a bunch of other rollups are now building. I mean, you probably would know there's now base stack coming up, um, you know, through built by Spire Labs as well. So now there are different kinds of stacks being built. And what has happened through that is now it has become as simple as deploying a bunch of contracts to be able to have your own chain up and running. This is very different from, let's say, Cosmos style chain or Polkadot style chain, where right? we need to find hundreds of validators to run this. So one, rollups are much easier to spin up. And with the advent of, let's say, OP stack and all the stacks, or with the advent of RAS providers like ourselves, I would say it has become 10x or 100x easier to launch a rollup. And because of that, what has happened is we are seeing a bunch of rollups being launched. Right? Every single day, you would see at least one or two rollups being built in stealth. We ourselves have onboarded at least 40 clients across testnet and mainnet across all the stacks. And then, of course, we are the only, the one, only one of the RAS providers. There are, I don't know, five other providers as well. So I think it's quite likely to say that there will be at least 1,000 rollups by end of 2024. And we probably are about 300 or something close there. Um, now, what happens when you have so many rollups, right? You have some problems. First of all, uh, if you look at some of the established ones like Optimism and Arbitrum, they run with this centralized sequencer model. It's kind of fine uh, for several reasons. One is because in the end, of course, there are certain issues with centralized sequencer around liveness, you know, in terms of you know, censorship, in terms of MEV extraction and so on. But because these sequences are run by established foundations like, you know, OP Labs or Arbitrum Foundation, you kind of trust them in some way. You can trust them that they will not do anything malicious. But that won't apply. This, this, this idea won't apply to rollups that are being launched by arbitrary anonymous DAP developers. They could actually take OP stack, fork it, insert something malicious into it, and be able to kind of steal funds if, if they wanted to. Right? 
So centralized sequencing kind of works with established rollups because you kind of trust them, but it doesn't work for a long tail of dApps that may emerge through OP stack and some of the stacks that may come up. Yep. Um, yes, sorry, you had a question, Andy? No, I just, I, a couple of things. First is on the on the RAS point, I think like um, many of, like the RAS providers are, are basically figuring out that RAS doesn't provide any network effects um, in the sense that like there's not, there's not something there that is like, not super commoditizable so like moving away from that i think is what we'll see and then um and so i'm particularly excited to learn more about this model and then i i also just put out a tweet saying i think there's there's also not only are centralized sequencing be, are the norm now and that they're somewhat okay with trusted stacks um there's also kind of a lack of incentive for the larger rollups to actually move away from that sure. uh, which is kind of problematic um but like I don't know, that's that's a very kind of hot topic. Um, sure. But yes, these are these are some of the issues for sure. Um, and I think the other like biggest one here uh, is the composability. But I'll kind of let you get to that. Yeah, uh, we actually just had a really fun podcast uh, about app specific sequencing yesterday, um, which was like quite interesting. So yeah, I'll, I'll let, I just wanted to make those points. Sure, of course, one of the very valid points. So yeah, I mean sequencing is of course a major problem that I know there's all sorts of debate going on. But there are other, other problems as well, right? For example, if everything goes on Ethereum, you won't have to worry about, you know, let's say finality time and things like that. And how do you withdraw from this L2 to L1? And those sort of things start to become more prominent, right? Um, so especially in case of optimist rollups, you have to wait for this withdrawal period. Even in case of ZK Sync or some of the ZK rollups, just for safety reasons, they have been built some sort of a withdrawal period in some cases, right? So even for example, in case of ZK Sync mainnet, you cannot withdraw instantly. There's a withdrawal period. It's not necessarily because of the stack or, or because of the tech. It's mostly because they feel like the tech is still relatively new, and so it's good to post, put some some buffer period, right? And then, of course, uh, because you have now these hundreds thousands of rollups, you need to be able to figure out some way to kind of interop it, right? And you could do that initially on L1, but you can't do that in a synchronous way, you know, in a straightforward manner through 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 rollups. But of course, you know, there are work being done there, and then of course there are other problems. But but basically, these are some of the problems that you would see if you were, if you were to have thousands of rollups immediately like going today. So where does the reach take rollup fit in, right? So basically it's a it's a framework that we've designed, which is designed in a modular way. And I'll come back to what I mean by this modularity here. But basically it's a rollup that takes a certain stack like OP stack and gives them certain kind of AVSs that helps them with different things. So for example, you could imagine something like let's say Arbitrum, right? Um, today Arbitrum has fraud proof enabled. But the problem is that the validator set that is allowed to get involved in challenges and things like that, it's permissioned. Now they're building this thing called Bold, right? That allows anyone to become a validator. Anyone can potentially become a challenger. But that would assume that you have a network. That would assume that you have some number of nodes that are actually observing the network and challenging it if, if needed. And you could do that, for example, using something like an AVS, right? So once you have a restate rollup, you have this rollup, but you have this bold like framework that allows you to do challenges for your rollup. So restaking brings that kind of network for challenges. Restaking brings a way to faster finalize your transactions. It also gives you better security, for example, in case of less than decent sequencer set, right? So you could have build an AVS that is not necessarily shared. It could potentially, it's not like Espresso where it's shared across all the rollups, but it could be your own specific sequencer set. And that gives you security and decentralization for your rollup. And lastly, it brings restaking to rollups. That's also important because to build these networks, you need to be able to borrow security. You don't want to launch your own token and build another Cosmos style chain. So restaking helps you in borrowing all that security in a much easier way. It helps you bootstrap that security quite quickly. Uh, what, is, what is really important is that we try to minimize as much as possible the changes that have to go to the underlying rollup stack. Okay, Because yeah. the problem is that if you change too much, it diverges from the initial initial let's say stack code base, and they'll be very difficult to maintain, right? That's one of the criteria. So for example, let's say, if you are looking at Superchain or OP stack, uh, Superchain may build, or Superchain actually is building some sort of interop solution right, right at the moment for all the Superchain rollups. And if you make too many changes to the underlying stack, they'd be very difficult to be able to tap into all the benefits that Superchain gives you. So we try to minimize that as much as possible. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Andy. Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, the. The way that you describe the restake rollup is that there is this basically that the AVS uh, aspect of it 
is is the restaked um, ETH that provides the security and eventually here the, the slashable eigen token. Um, but but um, that security that you're deriving from is not the same as uh, the security that you would get by building an, a, a quote unquote normal rollup and using Ethereum for DA. It's more it's, it's more of like a design of like uh, akin to like a um, like a validium or like a side chain. Is is that right or no? So so for example, let's say let's consider for example um, the um, let's say decentralized sequencing for example, right? Yeah. So um, today, if Arbitrum wanted, they could build a local consensus protocol for their sequencer set. Right? So instead of just running one sequencer and that one sequencer orders transactions in and out, they could basically have let's say five nodes, let's say, and that yeah. five nodes would run a local consensus among themselves and be able to say, okay, this is the final order. And that has nothing to do with what you do with Ethereum. So whatever security property you're getting from Ethereum, you're still getting it. That's not changing. Right. So, so the only thing that you did was you added a new local consensus on your sequencer set. Okay. And what, what you're saying is that you could do that with an AVS, for example, if you wanted. Got it. So it's like it's like sequencer rotation. Exactly. For example, More. yes. 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 So okay. for example, you could have a five, let's say five node AVS, and you could say, I don't know, after every X blocks. Uh, this sequencer would be selected to do this. So it could be a round robin mechanism, right? Or it could and, be a and then, system as well. Yeah. And then these restake rollups would use like Eigen for Eigen DA or Celestia or Ethereum for DA, or kind of like whatever the whatever they, they want. want. Blob. They could use Ethereum blob, you know, nothing changes. So today Arbitrum itself or Optimism itself can build a decentralized sequencer set while using Ethereum blobs as a TA layer. They could do that. Yes. That won't change anything. But yeah, the rollups that come to us, most of them don't want to use Ethereum DA, right? Yeah. I mean, right now blobs have changed dynamics, but you know, pre, you know, prior to blobs, no one wanted to use Ethereum yeah. because it's too expensive. So they wanted to use something like Celestia or something like you know, I can DA. I can DA. Yeah. And so you could use that, and then it becomes like you're not like depending on definition of rollup, you're not you're not really a rollup rollup, but you're like you're a rollup that uses let's say I can DA or some some other some other DA solution. What I'm saying is that you could still use Optimism. The way it works today, and you could just replace that your centralized sequencer by a decentralized sequencer, and you still be a rollup in the way of optimism and arbitrum are rollups today. Okay, nothing changes. Understood. Um, okay, so basically, what I, what we mean by deep stake rollup is basically three different AVSs, and again, you can pick and choose which one you want. So, for example, let's say if you don't care about sequencer set um, or decentralized decentralized sequencer, you don't have to pick pick that AVS. You could pick something else. So it's a completely, this is what I mean by modular. So it's, they are modular in the sense that you can pick and choose which one you want and you can combine them in certain ways. Uh, so the first uh, sequence of, uh, first um, uh, AVS is what we call squad, um, in short for like a team. It's basically a, an AVS for decentralized sequencing, as I mentioned earlier. And again, you, can, you could potentially have different configuration in which how you want to run this. So for example, you have a, let's say, a set of nodes that are operators in the eigenlayer um, notation, you have some operators that you that you ask them to, to bring restake assets, and once they have brought in enough collateral, enough stake, then you allow them to become your, your, your sequencer. You could also, because it's an app-specific model, you could say, I don't want this to be completely open. I want this to be operating in a POA-style model, where I would whitelist who becomes my sequencer through some sort of a governance mechanism, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so you could say, look, I'm going to do a vote, and I have selected, let's say, I don't know, Figment, Block, Demon, and the likes to become a set of potential set of operators, and my committee will vote on which operators are supposed to be my sequencer set. Okay, so it doesn't necessarily have to be fully open because it's an app-specific model, so you can customize in all sorts of ways. So you could say, I'm going to select yep. whitelist my own set, and then that set will act as my sequencer set. And again, that different models. Rather than yeah, sorry, God. sorry. So rather than. Uh, in the traditional kind of RAS model, where effectively each RAS provider is running the sequencer of these rollups, or, or or is running that hardware, you're giving the the ability for uh, these teams to either run their own like single node, or is it just they can run they have to run a, a set of nodes with with different actors, or can they just run their own single node as well? Yeah, so there, there could be there could be two. I would, I would say propose to have at least two nodes at the very minimum. Okay. One could be run by the RAS vendor, okay, because yes. they understand the mechanics much better than the underlying project. And the second yes. could be run by the underlying project. So the DAO. Understood. So I would say this is the base. Like if you want to decentralize, at least put two things, right? At least two, two yes. At the very minimum, otherwise there's no point. 
Uh, but in this model, you could have two RASs compete on the same sequence of set as well. So for example, you could have, let's say, in a model where you have, let's say, three nodes, and one node is run by, let's say, Altlayer, the other node is run by, let's say, Caldera, and third node is run by the project itself. And mm -hmm. then Altlayer and Caldera could compete on sequencing fees. Mm -hmm. So they have an auction mechanism, right, in the sense that yep. so does. you could say, look, block number X is ready to be, you know, to be to be sequenced. Who's going to bet or who's going to auction it? Like who's going right. to bid, right? Yep. And the entity that is willing to 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 put the best bid gets taken, right? And he's he has the right, it has the right to 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 sequence for that block. So it could be in that model as well. Uh, so we are giving that flexibility in how you want to manage this. Of course, the different frameworks need to be built. For example, run round robin mechanism, sort of consensus mechanism, sort of a stake based mechanism, yep. or a completely permission thing, or an auction based mechanism. But there are wide there are wide ways in which you could implement this. So this is this is at a high level what Squad does. The second part is called, which we call Vital. It's considered as a decentralized challenger network. So as I said, in case of Arbitrum, or hopefully you know, it will happen with Optimism as well, where you will have fraud proof mechanism built in. And fraud proof works only if you have someone observing the network. I mean, the security model assumes that there's at least one honest party that is actually looking at the network on a regular basis and be able to flag anything that looks malicious. Right. But of course, you can't have just one node, right? Because it's not going to work. Because if you have only one node observing it, and if that node goes down, basically things kind of have to be escalated at the social layer, which is not good. So what you want is at least some number of nodes. It doesn't have to be millions. It doesn't have to be 10,000, but at least some number of nodes um, that gives you enough redundancy to, to operate. And for example, in case of Arbitrum, if I recall correctly, there are like 10, if I'm not wrong, 10 or 15, something around that. Uh, Two digit numbers maximum number of nodes that are currently validating Arbitrum, uh, you know, mainnet. Yep. So the the role of this uh, network would be again that you come in as an operator, and you will have to stake your you know, your restake ETH, and then you would observe the network and how it, how the blocks are produced, and if any block looks, you know, bad or malicious to you, you would report that. You would say, look, this is this is wrong, and he's a proof that this block has been done. Uh, as the operators, that's the operator's responsibility. Yes. Yes. So you have the sequencer, sequencer comes in with a block. There's an executor that executes the block and tells you here's the last or the final state. And then these are the operators that are challengers. They will challenge that block. They will say, look, look, this block doesn't look good. Okay. Okay. So at a high level, this is what Vital does. So it, it is a network of, a decent network of challenges. And again, if you lose the, the bisection game, then you would lose your, you know, you lose your stake. The same with uh, Arbitrum Orbit's uh, bisection protocol works. Yep. And the third one is what we call Mark. It's uh, it's a fast finality layer. So, for example, if today if you want to rely on Ethereum's finality, you have to wait for the rollup uh, sequencer or the executor to post blocks or the transaction data on Ethereum, right? And because Ethereum does not have instant finality or single slot finality, you have to wait for 12 to 13 minutes for that block to be finalized, and that's not ideal. And so, what people end up doing is they rely on sequences. To give you instant confirmation, but again, sequencer have no economic backing. So sequencer could say something to you, and they could lie, and they decide not to post those transaction at all. And so the idea behind Mark is to give you slightly stronger guarantee around around sequences. As you can imagine, all of this still makes your rollup still your rollup still remains a rollup. Nothing changes. These are additional services that you could have to make your rollups better, secure, and decentralized. OK, um, so at a high level, this is how it works. Uh, in a setup model, so you have, let's say, users um, who hold ETH or any of the LSTs. They will take their ETH and LSTs. They will delegate that to a certain operator. And that operator will pick um, you know, which of these AVS will they support for a certain rollup. And for example, let's say Figment comes in, and Figment says, oh, you know what, I want to support be a decentralized sequencer operator for, I don't know, let's say, some 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 rollup. And you could have, they could be assigned to that rollup. And again, because of that, you know, they will be rewarded through the rollup provider. It could be in terms of their own native token. It, co it could be in terms of native yield that comes from, let's say, sequencing revenue. For example, today, Arbitrum, if they wanted, they could, again, if they wanted, they could decentralize the sequencer set, and they could say, look, whatever sequencing revenue we make, let's say X percent of that would go to um, these uh, you know, operators that are running my decent sequencer network, and then Y percent would go to the DAO. You know? So they could divide in certain ways. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I I think the 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 main thing here is that um, the roll up token part where right now like 
um, the tokenomics of rollups are kind of uh, weak in the sense that there's not really a lot to do with them. Um, there's kind of used for governance, but that's also like kind of uh, the most basic use case because of like regulatory reasons or because of just lack of uh, uh, decision making within a DAO. Um, like, what? Why is the rollup token a key part of this model? And like, does that just provide more economic security, or does that provide these the, the these operators with like something to, uh, like some basically some better tokenomics? Or like, what what's the thought process here? Look, I mean, green staking is great, but I think at some point people would have like, all these rollups will have a token. Let's be honest, it's not going to go away. So if you're launching a rollup, there will have to be a token at some point in the future. Uh, up until recently, the only thing that you could do with your token was put it as a gas token, that's all, or governance token, right? Uh, so for example, Arbitrum uh, and Optimism have used OP token or the ARP token as a governance token. Yeah. Um, they haven't used for gas for many reasons, right? One is, for example, it creates all sorts of user experience issues, right? So for example, if you want to come and use Arbitrum, you have to go and change ETH and blah, 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 right? It is too painful. Um, and the thing is, like, for Arbitrum and Optimism, it kind of even makes sense. They might even do it, right? And it, it might even work. But the problem is that it may not work with app specific rollups because you would have these 10,000 you know, islands, little islands working. And imagine if, as a normal user, you have to go and check and go and buy that token to be able to transact on that specific chain, it's going to be painful, super painful. And the other thing is that unless you generate huge revenue in your token, in the end, you are paying Ethereum fees, right? Because you have to post data on Ethereum. So you have to, at some point, you have to convert your token to Ether and then be able to pay that um, to Ethereum validators which also kind of creates some sort of sell pressure on your token essentially, right? So it's not a good idea, but eventually, like what I'm saying that initially people, all, all everyone wanted to have their own token as a gas token, but I think people realized over time, that's not really a good idea for many reasons. And so how could the token get used? And one way is to pair it up with restaking, right? So for example, you could say, look, I, I'm, I'm willing to bring restake ETH because it gives me all the benefits of, of restaking. And if let's say my token, let's say goes down for whatever reasons, at least I have some security that comes with Ethereum, right? So you give the balance. But in the end, you also want your token to be used. You also want to reduce you know, your, your you know, full reliance on Ethereum. That's not ideal either, right? Because you still want to capture value in your own token as well in some point. So I'd say it, it gives many benefits. Uh, one is it gives more utility to your token and it's much better choice compared to using your token as a gas token for your up. And the second thing is it also brings value accrual to your to your token. So, for example, if you want if you want sequencing Romy to be distributed to let's say your staker, that could happen through this mechanism. Got it. Because I think those tokens are still kind of struggling with like how do we do how do we get utility? Like what's the like what's the you know what's the point of having one? And obviously, like, there's the, the token solves the nothing at stake problem currently in terms of like. There's governance and there's DAO voting, there's grants that you can do, and there's an ecosystem you can build. But yeah, I'm super keen to see more and more like L2s kind of take an innovative approach to how they want to do their tokenomics. So, yeah, I mean, uh, honestly, this, this months, is cool. honestly, six months ago, everyone that was, so the people were coming to us on the RAS side, they were saying, hey, when would Arbitrum Orbit or when would OP Stack support gas token, like custom gas token? Yeah, yeah. There's demand for it, honestly. And, and therefore, we pushed Arbitrum guys and OP guys. We gave them feedback that, hey, you should have this feature as soon as possible because everyone is looking for it. But sadly, when it actually went live, people started to back off. Uh, not saying that the feature was bad. It's just they realized over time that that's maybe not a good idea. It's not a good idea to use your own DAP token as a gas token for your because it just creates also painful experiences. But they really yes. need to bring the token use. And one, one way is this. Yeah, cool. Okay, so um, um, so this is the squad part. So at a high level, what happens is a user takes in transactions, uh, sends through their classical RPC providers, and this transaction goes to the network, uh, which is built using restaking. And then uh, you could have different mechanisms that uh, you know, could employ to order transactions. For example, you could have a round robin mechanism where you could say, I'm going to select. Um, so every, let's say, um, sequencer has the right to sequence the first, the text 10 block, for example. And it kind of rotates in a certain way. It could be an auction mechanism uh, where you know the rights to sequence a block is auctioned off to certain players, uh, and people would bid. There could be consensus mechanism as well if you wanted. Unfortunately, at the moment, um, as far as we know, Eigenlayer does not have a consensus protocol built in among the operators. It doesn't come out of the box. So if you wanted to do that, you have. What does to that mean? 
So, so let's say, for example, I wanted to basically run a small Cosmos network, let's say, style network, like through, through Tendermint. You can't do that directly with Eigenlayer. So at the moment, the way Eigenlayer works is these AVSs will sign things, but that's it. Okay. They don't run a consensus protocol like BB, PBFD. Uh, so I, Got it. I, so, yeah. so, so the AVSs amongst themselves cannot come to like a global, a global consensus amongst themselves. In, in a true consensus sense, it's not possible. Uh, right. They would reach consensus in a multi-sig style way, if you see what I mean. Like they, they would reach Understood. consensus. Okay, here's my thing. Here's my vote. But what if the, you know, those votes are blocked in some way at the network level? Those, those sort of things doesn't get considered. Yes. Live okay. So there's certain issues that you can't build in, but like. Eventually, at some point, I think I can level build this BFT as well, so you could actually have a proper consensus among those nodes. So to have like a Got it. little little Cosmos chain, for example. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they, they, as I said, there are different mechanism you could build uh, your squad, and then again, the squad basically spits out a block which is ordered, and then that goes to Ethereum in the same way it goes to uh, it works with other rollups today. Uh, and again, um, if let's say for example. If you see something like, "Hey, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm here to," like, here's my order, and if you deviate from that order, for example, let's say in an auction model, right? You are the one who bid, and you are the winner of that bid, of the auction. But if you decide not to post that block, then you'll be slashed, for example, right? So this is where slashing comes to play. So your stake. So, so the the sequencers who want to participate in the network in this kind of rotational model have to put up some, yes, some collateral at stake. Let's yeah, that, that's the yeah, yeah, exactly. That, that's the restaking thing, right? So everyone brings and in those are those are operators that are that are doing that, or no, those are like, those are just separate entities. No, so operators are the ones that are running the client, the, the sequencing right. client, and users who have ETH, they would delegate their ETH to these operators. Understood. Okay, so they would say, Look, I have 100 ETH, I'm gonna to delegate to, to you to this operator, which is let's say maybe figment. And the figment is the one running that sequencer client for that. And would those would those would those users uh would would those uh you know uh stakers or restakers be able to would they be eligible for the yield that comes from the sequencing rights that they yes. win in these lotteries or in these auctions? Yes. So for example, today okay, so that's where the yield's gonna come from, then it's gonna come from the sequencing. Exactly. So there are two ways in which you could get yield. One is by the way, uh, okay. Uh, I can recently released this uh, post, um, I think about a month ago, about this. They didn't have the payment mechanism built in, but I can has released it very recently. Where the idea is, the AVS will, or the network will basically push incentives, and then whatever incentive goes out, ten percent of that stays with the operator, and the remaining goes to the delegators. If this hundred dollars comes out in terms of rewards, then ten dollars will go to the operator, and the remaining ninety dollars will get distributed to all the all the delegators that have delegated to that specific operator. Okay, so that's something that they have fixed at the moment. So you can't change that metric quite today. I think at some point they will make it flexible. But at this moment, you can actually do that, and you you are forced to pay ten percent to the operator. Uh, so by the way, there are two mechanisms which you could you could reward. One is like pure token. Let's say for example your rollup doesn't actually generate much revenue. Right. Let's say in that case you would pay uh, incentives in your token, the rollup token. And let's say when the future, when your when your sequencer, uh, you know, your, when your rollup kind of sees traction and when it has actually started to produce revenue, at that point you could potentially reduce your, um, you know, reduce your token incentive or token inflation by saying, okay, only ten percent of that will come from inflation; the remaining would come from the actual revenue that my rollup makes. You yep. could do that. Yep. Okay, so um, the second part, as I said, is vital. It is a challenger network. So consider something like, um, unfortunately, um, so by the way, these two things are not built yet, just to be very clear. There's something that we're still thinking about it. And the reason it's not built yet, because there's certain things that we're waiting for the underlying rollup stack to be developed. And I'll give an example of this. So for example, vital, right? So um, vital is mainly for decentralized challenging. So um, again, um, for maritime context, which is the only one, I think, that is live with fraud. I think probably fuel as well has, has it. But let's say let's start with Arbitrum. So Arbitrum has this fraud proof mechanism been built. Uh, but the problem is the people who can actually do challenges, they are permission today. And that's changing with the new protocol that's called Bold. 
Uh, with bold, anyone can become a challenger. And then if the um, the rollup commits a certain block and you if this challenger feels like that rollup is invalid or the block is invalid, then you can go and challenge. And if you you would engage in a fraud proof game with the with the sequencer uh, with the executor, and then you if you win, then you'll get your get some money. Um, so the idea is, if you wanted to extend that to app specific rollups, you need this network, right? You need a network that comes out of the box when you launch the rollup, and that's what Vital is. So um, again, very similar flow. So you you use the state transactions, they send it to the sequencer, which again, by the way, it could be a centralized sequencer. By the way, all of this is modular, so you don't have to use Vital with Squad. You could use purely Vital and not Squad. So it could be a centralized sequencer. Then you have someone that executes those transactions and commits a state. And then the vital comes in, the decent network would say, okay, look, you have posted this block, but this block is invalid. And here's a proof. And you have to engage with me on challenges. And you could do this through the entire bold protocol. So vital operator will run basically the bold client that's being built by Arbitrum. Okay. And again, the incentive comes from the same way where if you if you win the challenge, you will earn rewards. Okay, so um Again, when we come to the idea of uh, using this vital mechanism as an AVS, which is restaked ETH, um, this this is this is sounding like the security that we're getting is from a all, like a committee, if you will. That's not uh, it's not like the L one, and then we're also getting some L one security. So this is like this is like from a technical perspective it's it's less it'd be less secure than a typical roll up that's not getting any security from a committee that's not just the l1 no 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 this, this is not what am i missing yeah so let, let me explain so in arbitrum today you have these nodes uh, which are whitelisted today okay and these nodes they have nothing to do with l1 or l2 they're just nodes they're just nodes you know they're people or entities running some client that's it Okay, that's nothing to do with L1, nothing to do with L2. So they're just nodes. What they do is they take blocks that has been produced by the validators in case of our you know, Arbitrum, they're called validators. So the validators take transactions from sequencer and they produce a block. And then these um, these challengers uh, will take this block and will check whether the block is valid. Again, so far they're all doing this off chain. There's nothing on chain here. They're just doing yes. this off chain. Yes. When they feel like, okay, this is something wrong, there's something wrong here, then they will do challenge on the L1. Okay. So the whole challenge actually happens. Again, challenge is also bisection protocol, also off chain, but parts of that goes on chain. Okay. So those, those things will happen on chain. Vital doesn't change any of that. What it only okay. says that network, that number of nodes that were doing these challenges, now we have to be we have to make it decentralized. So they will now form a network and they will still do the same thing, which is they challenge and then they will you know, do the challenge and post things on the L1. Nothing changes there. Only thing that we're doing is we're saying that that network that previously was permissioned, now you can make it public by using the bold protocol. Got it. Okay. So, yeah, so it's more about decentralizing the challenging of um, the roll-up blocks Correct. than it is about inheriting security from the l1 Correct. um Correct. like changing where you're getting the security from exactly exactly so you're not changing any of that you're just saying hey i want to have some node of network some network of nodes to do this how do i find those nodes right yeah. and how do i make sure that those nodes have some collateral otherwise you, do, you know if, if you bring random people with no collateral they will just lie things right they don't have to wait yeah. there has to be some mechanism to bootstrap that network and restaking is that mechanism Okay, but you're not changing your security protocol. You're still relying on L1 for all these, uh, you know, fraud proofs to be settled. That still happens on the L1. This is not a this is not a chain. Okay, there's just a bunch of nodes. Got it. Makes sense. Okay. Um, okay. So this is vital. So again, uh, to caveat this, so Squad and Vital is still being built simply because, as I said, Bold protocol is not built yet. Right. So we are still waiting for. I mean, okay, built yet, but it's it's on test nets. So it's not kind of for orbit chains quite yet. So we can't use it quite yet. But the idea is once that becomes completely public, then we would be able to build more protocol as a part of Vital. What is what is ready today and what's being what's live today in production is the third thing that we call MAC, which is basically a fast finality layer. Um, now it's slightly weaker than than I would say vital in the sense that 
in vital the nodes actually go and challenge they could actually go and engage with let's say your your you know faulty block right mark doesn't want to do that mark is slightly weaker than that they also they basically check up take a block and they run things and if they look okay to you they say look here's everything is good here's my attestation to it that's all the mark operators don't go and engage in in protocol and of course you can extend it if you wanted to but we try to keep the design slightly simpler and modular you say okay if you only want fast finality don't worry about challenging then you can just use mark but if you actually want to do challenges, then you could use Vital. Okay. Um, again, the motivation is very simple. Um, you know, you rely on Ethereum today for finality, but finality on Ethereum takes 12 minutes, and that's not ideal. And so what ends up happening is people end up relying on the sequences. And sequences give you these pre-confirmations, basically a pinky promise that says, hey, I've seen your transaction. Here's how I'm going to order it. But that's it. There's no guarantee that I will actually abide by it. Yeah. And that's, that's a weak promise. Um, and so how do you how do you make it stronger? And the idea is you can combine uh, eigenlayer with this op mechanism to make it slightly stronger. And the way it works is you have the sequencer. Again, it, it could be centralized, decentralized, it doesn't matter, right? You you take your sequencer, sequencer takes you the block, gives you the block. You take the block and you also take the state and you give it to this mark network. Mark network will check whether the blocks look okay. They will not do challenges. This is the main difference. They're not challenging anything. They're just checking okay. good to them. If the mark network is happy, they will sign your thing. They would say, look, here's my attestation on this block. This block looks good to me. And then they, they can potentially pass that data to Ethereum. Okay. So it kind of like it becomes like a middleware network that sits between the sequencer and Ethereum. Okay. The good thing about Mark is because like sequencer doesn't have any stake in the system, but Mark network has. So if they misbehave, if they say, look, this block is actually invalid, or this block never gets committed on Ethereum, then they will get slashed. Okay, but doesn't the sequencer in your model theoretically go, is going to have stake in the vital model? So, so okay, okay. we'll have stake. Okay, so this is designed in a way that sequencer could both be, you know, it could be centralized model, it could be a squad. Okay, it doesn't happen. Understood. Okay. So it's, it's designed in a modular way, okay? So you could decide not to use squad at all, not to use vital at all. You just, you want to use mark. Understood. So for example, today, you could use mark network with OP stack, OP, OP mainnet. You could use mark network with, with arbitrum, arbitrum mainnet. Okay. And you're not changing the sequencer mechanism. You're not changing how the fraud proof mechanism works. All you're saying is, I'm going to take a block from the from the arbitrum mainnet, uh, you know, block, and I'm going to verify if it looks good to me, so that you don't have to wait for Ethereum to very validate it. Okay. And because I'm putting stake into it, I know that if I say something bad, if my block gets this block gets invalid or is considered invalid, then my stake will get slashed. And so I have some incentive in the game, which sequencers don't have. Okay. Yeah. Um. So um, I can talk in as, uh, as uh, I mean, at, the, at the time of this being out, it'll be live. It, it'll be trading in the billions somewhere. But like the the concern with this is that if 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 Mac Network can't ha can't accrue enough operators willing to commit uh, and delegate restaked ETH to it, then there's only there's a certain threshold that of roll up size if you, of TVL or of or of, of the amount of transaction volume or or, or how much value is being uh, sequenced? That like there's a threshold that is like a, a ceiling to where where the stake um, of the Mac network becomes uh, less than the value being transacted on in the sequencer, and the the uh, the the like the alignment of, of incentives skews towards the Mac network could theoretically like. Um, there could be operation operator collusion in accepting of slashing if there's a outcome on, on the sequencer side where they have other stake that is positively affected if this transaction goes through to ethereum so how, how, like is that i mean like i, I and i'm going on a limb here so like mm -hmm. fill in some gaps but like how, how are you thinking about that it's, it's a very valid question okay so um so there are kind of theoretical things and there are kind of practical things that happens in, in, in real world, right? So to give an example. <laughs> no, let's, let's, let's be honest about it, right? So I mean, in, the in theory, um, your mark network normally, uh, I think Siram coined this term, which is like uh, some sort of a weighted average over a week or something. So for example, let's say you're building a bridge, let's say, using AVS mechanism, using restaking. You the amount of amount of um, the amount that you can secure depends on on the kind of the stake that is being there right so for example let's say if you want to secure 
let's say 100 let's say your bridge does 100 million of trading uh, 100 million of volume uh by directionally on a weekly basis then at least you have you should have 100 million of stake ETH there to at least last at least at the very least because otherwise you know anyone can come in and if you let's say if you're less they're, they're willing to sacrifice this because they can actually steal the entire 100 million right now that's 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 the theoretical thing which is true which is true now the thing is it depends on how how easy it is to slash how slashable the system is right so in a bridge and we have seen that in the past right bridges have been hacked many times and therefore therefore slashing risks are quite high um if let's say if we consider mac as a really an, a, a system that is very prone to slashing then of course you have to make sure that you have to have enough quality enough enough let's say uh restake assets to be able to slash them so for example if your daily transaction volume is let's say 10 million dollars a day mark network must have at least a collateral of 10 million at the very minimum right so that that's that's i agree with you now in practical terms um slashing unfortunately is not enabled today on eigenlayer it will come at some point but it's not enabled today second thing is we believe that mark network will probably not have huge slashing risk because all you're doing is basically saying hey sequencer is doing things here's my here's my attestation that's it your sequencer and the evaluator are the ones that are actually being the more risky nodes in a sense. All you're doing here, all you're doing is as, as an operator is just taking things and signing it. That's it. You're not doing any more than that. So also the slashing risk is much lower. That's the first, first point. The second point is yep. today we have about five marks live. And literally, we had to limit the total amount of ETH that could have been staked there. The first mark that we <laughs> have, have has five billion dollars worth of ETH stake restake there. Yeah. Which, in my opinion, will never get used, right? Five so that's million. that's one of the larger AVSs, then. Yes, that's probably one of the largest. I mean, probably some of them have probably even large, but that's one of the largest AVSs. I think the least, the one, the AVS that we have live today that has the least amount of ETH, that has about 100k ETH, I think, at, at the very minimum, which is still quite large. So I would say that's enough. But I, I see your point. I, I I agree with your point. But as long as your mark network has enough restake security compared to let's say daily volume or monthly volume or something of that kind, you're fine. Correct. You're fine. And the, the actors would have to be highly sophisticated to pull this off and also be well capitalized. So um, today, for example, in operators, most of the operators don't bring their own capital, by the way. Unless you're right. point base or things like that, you don't bring your own capital. Mostly it's get delegated. So you and me, we like users, we have ETH you know, left over. You'd say, look, here's my ST ETH to the, and we delegate to the operator. Operators generally don't bring their own ETH. Yeah. Uh, and though they're, honestly, they're not risking that much. Maybe that should change, but they're not risking that much, as far as I know. Yeah. Cool. Got it. Well, that was my only question there. Okay. So, um, and by the way, if if you have fast finality layer, you could potentially build an interop through that. So the way it will work is, let's say you have roll up A and you have roll up B. Roll up A takes his transactions on state, gives it to Mark. Mark checks it and verifies it. And then informs, like signs it and says, look, here's my signature on this on this roll-up A block. And it's, it passes it to roll-up B. Okay. And roll-up B says, look, this mark guys have verified it. It looks good to me. I can now do something with this. So for example, let's say you wanted to do a lock mint style transaction across these roll-ups. So you would have a lock transaction roll-up A. That block goes to mark. Mark verifies that it's indeed a roll-up uh, transaction with lock transaction in. And then it will inform roll-up B that, look, everything looks good to me. Take my word for it. And roll-up B would then uh, would then act upon it. So, for example, it will it will mint something on roll-up B. Now, if something goes wrong, again, mark will will mark stake will get slashed. So you could potentially build some sort of interop layer using leveraging mark as your verification layer. So it's kind of like some of the bridges that exist today, where you have these nodes that are that are acting as a POS network and they're verifying things for you. So it's, it's kind of similar to that. So. Yeah. Um, but. So how, how is roll up B going to have, so this isn't going to be atomic interoperability. This is not going to be settled in the same States across different rollups, it's but it's just that it's just that if I can get, fast confirmations from roll up a that my transactions are valid then i can share that that state route with roll up b and they can attestate the validity of that and then basically that interoperability trend like that transaction or, or basically the interoperability providers between those two roll ups 
um, can facilitate faster, um, faster interop in like the in like the traditional interop sense where you need like validators to kind of confirm on each side. Exactly. Exactly. This doesn't really change anything for intense based interop though. Like if if there's an intense based interop with solvers, they can go from roll up A to roll up B, regardless of the state finality of the finality of the chain because it's the solvers that are taking on the the inventory risk and the cross chain risk not the not the um not not the validators of, of this interrupt protocol but in those in those in those more like transport layer-esque protocols this can help them yes is that yeah. right yes exactly so for example let's say all the traditional bridges the way they existed uh, up until recently they all had to run a full node for exactly a, uh, on each system. chain yeah, yeah. On, on each chain exactly and that's not very scalable right Especially no. if you have thousands of rollups, right? You can't go and build and run a full node for every single rollup. No, no. Um, and so what you want to do is you want to rely on someone, some sort of research network that that gives you that confirmation that hey, look, you don't have to run full node. We are running a full node for you, and here's an economic stake behind it. So if if our operators were to lie or do something malicious, we will be we will be slashed at some point. Got it. Um, it. It helps you solve this requirement that every single bridge operator today has to run a full load. Now you don't have to because you have someone else running it for you with economic stake. Okay, that, that's that's important. Cool. And if you want it, you could have, for example, some of the other parties tap into this. In ideally, for example, let's say um, you could leverage, let's say, exchanges, for example. Certain centralized exchanges could leverage, let's say, Mark to say, look, I have I have this Mark network, and one of those operators is run by, let's say, Binance or Coinbase or whatever, and we have seen that the rollup blocks look good to us. And so we are happy to allow you to withdraw assets from my exchange uh, instantly because we are running full load. Okay. Yep. Uh, previously, they had to run the full load themselves. Now they don't have to. They could potentially be an operator in this set, or they could basically rely on someone else with, with that service. Right. So they could personally tap into that. So that's kind of the model here. Got it. Cool. Makes sense. Okay. So um, very so quickly summarize those. So there are technical benefits of Mark. For example, you get faster finality, much quicker. Um, you potentially uh, have the shared guarantee, as I said, across bridges, exchanges, and RPCs. They could all leverage that without running a full node themselves. You could potentially have this interoperability and potentially it could help you with some sort of MEV mitigation as well, but that's kind of a longer topic. Um, there are ecosystem benefits of this as well. Now, because of this Mark, you actually create, because you can use your own token, as I said earlier, you can actually have a token sync for your token. So an adapt developer who has a token can use that token as a restaking token here. It allows you to build a network, right? Because now you're not limited to a RAS vendor, which is a very closed system, right? Here is a closed system and RAS the one that does everything for you. Now you can, let's say, get your investors involved. You can get your you know, operators involved. So it becomes a much more network thing. Uh, and you can actually build a network around your infrastructure that was previously not possible. Um, and then allows it allows Ethereum validators to get involved for you, you know, with you as well. So if you if you you know if you're building a DAP and you want I don't know the likes of Chorus and all the validators that are on Ethereum today, you can get them involved today. And most importantly, it's we tried as I said earlier in the, in the beginning, we try to minimize as much as possible the changes that you have to make to the underlying underlying roll, rollup stack. So this way you can keep running your rollup the way it is running. You just add this bit on the side that helps you with these things. Okay, so you're not changing. So for example, if, if you're getting security from Ethereum, you're still the case. Your rollup hasn't become a validium. It's still rollup. Nothing has changed there. You're just adding an extra bit of piece that helps you with these services. What I'm saying is that yeah. basically if you cut that off, so tomorrow, let's say you switch Mark off, your system doesn't become less secure. Or if you add Mark, it doesn't become, system doesn't become more, uh, you know, uh, doesn't change the security of the model in that sense. It helps you in add additional security. I mean, this is a very lower level thing, but basically at a high level idea is that you have this Ethereum network that does everything for you. So you have all these, sorry for the visibility. Um, you have a bunch of contracts that come from eigenlayers. So for example, the way operators would register, uh, the way the operator stake will get considered and so on and so forth. So you have a bunch of contracts handling all of that on chain. And then you have this mark network where you have this operator that has to run a client, a client for, for example, for sequencing, a client potentially for challenger network like Bold or a client for faster finality. And then they would basically update things to to uh, uh, this proxy, and the proxy would sign transactions and say, look, I have seen this block. This block looks good to me. Here's my BLS signature. And then there's an aggregator thing which aggregates different signatures from all the all the operators, and that goes to Ethereum. And if enough signatures have been received, then you would consider that block to be valid. And and real quick, what is a BLS signature? 
So BLS is basically a signature mechanism that allows for better aggregation. So if you have many people signing, you don't have to have N signatures. You can basically compress them into one signature. So it combines. And so this is super, super useful for the AVSs because of their sign based exactly. model for verifications. Exactly. I mean, honestly, many US networks use BLS signatures today. Yes. Um, it's a way to compress signatures from many parties into one single signature. Awesome. Um, and this is like a, a mechanism, like on the contract side. So there's a way where um, you, uh, the operators inform Ethereum that, hey, on Ethereum contracts, that, hey, here's a block that looks not okay. And then you as a, as a user can actually query the contract to get the state. So you could say, okay, tell me if there are any blocks that don't look okay to you, and you would pull that data from the contract. And lastly, we have this, um, what we have built a gateway, which is like a proxy. So as I said, you could have many AVSs, one AVS for each rollup. So you can have one mark for, let's say, optimism chain, one mark for arbitrum chain, one mark for base chain, for example. And you want like a common gateway instead of kind of pinging each one of them individually. So you have this one common gateway that we call mark gateway. And you would say, hey, can you tell me if optimism blocks, uh, block number X looks okay to you? Or are there any alerts that you don't, you find, find weird uh, for optimism? And then it will kind of redirect to the right AVS and do everything for you. So it's kind of like a proxy and a wrapper around all the AVSs. Uh, well, this is the service manager side. It's basically a mechanism to uh, handle all the on-chain components for AVSs. So registration thing, uh, reporting thing, slashing thing, those sort of things that, that get needed for AVSs. And this is a, basically a, a function where you can check for alerts directly through Solid Contract. So it will, it will, you can make a query. There's a function called you can make a query. And uh, the function will tell you whether um, this chain has any in invalid block that the mark considers to be invalid. And uh, that's it. Um, I hope I'm not too too late. Still, nope, okay. it's good. My last yeah. question is: um, um, what do you anticipate the the kind of uh, demand for? um like i understand so we have the, the supply side of operators are going to be providing into squad um uh, vital and mac um and where do you like what kind of demand do you anticipate for for these as they go live from roll-up operators um and kind of uh what what is the yield situation potentially going to look like so um of course, on the operator side, everyone wants to have this because they know that um, there's no slashing risk today, at least for because of eigen eigen mechanism, eigen yeah. has enabled slashing. So, you know, for them, it's like free to operate anything as long as their cost gets covered, right? Uh, on the on the kind of reward side, um, and of course, many people want to use this because one, they give them. So, as a, as a roller builder, you want to have mark because it gives you. Uh, I mean, other than technical benefits, it gives a token utility. Your token is some utility, right? Some a way to create a sync, a way to accrue value, and so on. So it's beneficial for the for the for the builders who are building their own chain. And on the reward side, I think initially most of the mark operators will get reward from token incentives. It won't necessarily be rewards in pure revenue by the roller because only handful of projects today, and a handful of rollups actually make money. And in base, of course, arbitrum and optimism, but they're they're not too many. So I think I, I, I suspect that initially, uh, you know, the rewards or the yield would come come from uh, the token incentives directly by the by the project itself. Um, I mean, again, it depends. People say that whatever you, you're getting yield in terms of Ethereum, if you if 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 any incentive that's around one percent or even lower than that, that's fine because anyway, it's it's, it's there's not so much additional risk that you're taking as long as the underlying ABS is safe. So I would say. Something that tops up Ethereum yield by let's say one percent, I think that's something that people are expecting. Yep. But yeah, it's not going to be a pure POS style incentives. By the way, it's not going to be like I don't know, ten percent, twenty percent, thirty percent APY. No. Happen. Um, one thing to know that because Eigenlayer has this core mechanism built, so you could say I'm going to take my rewards. I'm going to give let's say seventy percent reward to my token stakers and only thirty percent of rewards to to Ethereum restakers, so they could they could decide how they how they adjust their rewards to these different communities. So it's quite possible that, and you'd be potentially encouraged as a community to push a lot more incentives to your token stakers than to Ethereum stakers restakers. Very interesting. It, it, it seems like a lot of things that are happening in the space right now, including in Eigenlayer as well as outside, are um, 
it, it seems like a lot of people are trying to lower the yields to ETH L1 validators and just like, how can we get this this capital moving elsewhere? Um, so it's going to be really interesting to watch play out over the next couple of years. Um, Amrit, I really enjoyed this conversation. I uh, learned quite a bit and I appreciate you you taking the time. As always, happy to, happy to be here. Thank you very much, Andy, for bringing me here. Fantastic. All righty. Speak to you soon. See you soon. Yeah.